great of you to join us for the next half hour in which we'll be looking at some familiar big issues. For example, how we can make progress on protecting nature and ultimately ourselves. Welcome to Eco Africa. My name is Sandra Twinovudio. Hi Sandra, I'm Chris Alems joining you from Ogun State, Nigeria. It's no secret that many raw materials will be exhausted within decades if we continue extracting them at the current rate. This also applies to sand as a raw material. So interesting stories that we have for you today. We'll talk about the devastating impact of sand mining on our environment. A company in Kenya making pencils without using wood. And how gorillas in Cameroon can be better protected. Ghana's coastline comprises over 500 kilometers of pristine nature, except some sections are far from unspoiled. As in many other countries, illegal along the Gulf of Guinea, sand mining is becoming increasingly widespread due to the growing demand for its use in construction. At the same time, local residents are clearing woodland areas in order to graze their livestock. A reporter on the ground investigates the consequences for the environment. The ocean has swallowed up everything Peter Corley once owned. When he looks out into the waves, he sees the place he used to call home. It's a kilometer away from where he currently stands. Almost a year after he was displaced, the fisherman is still traumatized. I lost eight, eight bedroom house with a kitchen, toilet and bath. It's deep inside the sea over here. Constant tidal waves have wreaked havoc in communities like Fuveme, Peter Akoli's former home, washing away houses, schools, community centers and displacing hundreds of people. Many families are still homeless. Ghana's coastline spans more than 500 kilometers. A quarter of its population live by the sea. A UNESCO study says almost 40% of Ghana's eastern coastal land was lost to erosion and flooding between 2005 and 2017. And the destruction is fast intensifying, causing concern for coastal experts and environmental activists. Sea level is rising, and once the sea level is rising, associated issues with sea level rise, coastal erosion, flooding, and then we could also talk about uh, saltwater intrusion. So the saltwater intru intrusion could affect, you know, agriculture within these areas. Fuveme, Keta and 15 other communities along the coast of Ghana's Volta region used to be prosperous fishing villages, but sea erosion has put pay to that. In local markets, there is barely any fish for sale. Other food produce is also in short supply, and farmlands are being taken over by seawater. Climate change isn't the only reason for the coastal erosion. Human activities like excessive groundwater extraction for use in farming is on the rise. Sand mining, where locals harvest sand from the shores for building, is also an issue. Some communities have banned the practice, but it is still prevalent. Trees, such as mangroves, that play a key role in protecting the coastline and marine wildlife, are being cut down for firewood. Local leaders worry about these activities and want them to stop. We have a role to play because it is we are close to the where the things have been. And with that is it does not take and down. Because even if the somebody from somewhere have come and started with something, we have to implement what it's about to. So, for instance, like as you say the Sanwini, if the people reset and they get to know that it's the Sanwini is causing the erosion. If we are the leader in the community people, if we don't put this to the action, if we don't stop, it will definitely cause us a problem. Researchers from the University of Ghana's Institute for Environment and Sanitation Studies have been studying the impact of climate change along the coastline for more than two years. They take samples of water, fish and plants for further study. 
They say that sea erosion isn't just affecting the coast, it's also endangering wildlife species in nearby lagoons and local people's health. If I take the Keta coastline, for instance, where they are doing sun winning, so what they are doing is allowing the seawater to flow into the land more and it causes flooding. And from a public health perspective, once the water flows and destroys sanitation facilities, for instance, in households that are very close to the sea, these sanitation facilities contaminate drinking water sources. In an effort to protect communities against the rising sea levels, the government has built stone seawalls along parts of the shoreline. It says it lacks the funds to protect all of the coast. The likelihood of future surging waters means that Peter Akoli and other coastal residents live in constant fear. He has given up hope of rebuilding for now. We are still afraid because now where the sea is now, it's just a stone throne from the first time. So we are always afraid. We don't know what to do. But we are praying to God to help us to take us through all this situation. Peter Akoli and more than 300 displaced families from his village now live in makeshift palm leaf structures. As fishermen, they don't want to move further inland. They can't leave the coast where their livelihoods are. The little they have could end up washed away by the ocean when the floods return. We've seen what can happen to the ecosystem in Ghana due to our hunger for sand. But what are the alternatives? How can we minimize our consumption of the resource? We're trying to track down some answers. Sand is everywhere. The tarmac on the road, the concrete in your house, the glass of your windows, and the silicon chip in your phone. We use more sand each year than any other material on the planet. And it's stood the test of time. But given that one third of all the land on Earth is classified as desert, you'd think sand would be easy to get hold of, right? Wrong. Even desert countries in the Middle East import sand from as far away as Australia and Canada. The world's tallest building is an 830 metre skyscraper in Dubai that was built with sand from more than 10,000 kilometres away. That's because of the type of sand that's fueling the world's construction boom. Desert sand is too smooth for most concrete because the grains have been polished by the wind. It's like the difference between running your hand over these round hazelnuts and these rough walnuts. There's not enough friction to make it strong enough to build. Instead, people take easy to reach sand from rivers, beaches and the sea floor. And this can't be replenished on human timescales. So how short are we? We know that demand for this resource is going to continue to grow and it's already causing problems in many places in the world. This is Louise Gallagher, author of a landmark UN report in 2019 on solving sand shortages. Now, scientists always complain they need more data, but when it comes to sand, they really have no idea. It is the second most consumed resource after water on the planet, and we don't know where it's coming from and on what the impacts of that are. Like, that's, that's the nature of the problem. But what they do know worries them. Researchers in 2017 modelled that global demand for sand is growing much faster than what's easily available. The world would need to make more sand, find new sources of it, or just use less. Otherwise, it will run out. This is a big problem because sand is a fundamental building block of modern life. Sand used in concrete has been essential to the global construction boom, as people in emerging economies move to cities. And people around the world are building more and more. India has become the second biggest cement producer. Over the last half century, Singapore has built artificial islands that have increased its landmass by a quarter. And it did this with massive amounts of sand imported from its neighbors. The sand crisis isn't even just a problem of scarcity. The industry is small scale and badly regulated, and that's hurting people and ecosystems today. Miners take sand from the bottom of rivers and the sea for low pay and without oversight. There are reports of child labor from India to Uganda. 
there's no protection, there's no, and, and the riverbed is getting deeper. So they have to constantly, you know, go deeper. Um, it can impact their eardrums, it can impact, you know, they develop all sorts of complica health complications. But of course, if it's illegal, there's no support at, at all, right, for them. Kieran Pereira is an independent researcher who's written a book on solving the sand crisis. She cites a report from an environmental group last year that counted 193 people who died through illegal sand mining in India in just two years. When we remove sand from such huge, massive quantities, it's bound to have impacts. And these impacts at the moment are externalized onto society and onto the environment. Uh, they, they are not, they're not reflected in the costs of the sand and gravel at all. Sand mining adds to climate threats like rising sea levels and drought. It erodes beaches, destroys riverbeds, and makes landslides more likely. An estimated half a million people living along the Mekong River will need to be moved from collapsing riverbanks, partly because of sand mining. In India, it's pushed species like the gharial crocodile to the verge of extinction. So how can we solve the global sand crisis? Experts say the first step is cutting the amount of concrete we use. That could mean using more efficient concrete mixers with less cement, or replacing it altogether with alternatives like timber or rammed earth. Building denser cities means less concrete for each person. Then sand needs to be reused. When buildings are demolished, the waste can be crushed and mixed into cement. Rubble can be used to make building foundations and roads. This already happens in some places where new building materials are expensive. Germany, for instance, recycles more than two-thirds of its construction waste. But in countries like India and Bangladesh, it's less than 10%. By taking that approach, we're taking into account the fact that this material is not uh, available to us in, in, in infinite terms, forevermore, in you know, all the availability we would want. The third thing is finding and certifying sustainable sources of sand. Take Greenland. It's increasing the world's supply of sand as its ice sheet melts. That already delivers 8% of the sediments added to the world's oceans each year. It's hard to believe, but global warming is speeding up that process. Experts say that mining Greenland sand could ease the pain of quitting concrete for the rest of the world. But it would have to be done together with local communities and without hurting the pristine Arctic wildlife. And that brings us to the final point. Those solutions just help fix the shortages of sand. But to protect people and nature, governments also need to regulate the industry and enforce rules to stop the illegal sand trade. We can build without sand. There are plenty of examples where sand, our ability to construct does not, uh, is, is not dependent on our, on our need for sand. We can decouple these two. And so we can still build and allow for human uh, prosperity without destroying our ecosystem. And talking about sand mining, it's an issue connected to our next report too. The illegal extraction of this resource is even more worrying when you consider a rise in sea levels and the growing amount of land already being swallowed. Indeed, and imagine, last year, the global sea level set a new record high, 97 millimetres, above the level in 1993. Now, what does that mean for the ordinary living in affected areas? We took a look in France. David Le Cordier is a sheep breeder in France. His business is threatened by the rising sea levels. Over there, we previously had pasture for the sheep, and the plot here was the fallback plot when there were high tides. The sheep were sheltered, but now the river has come closer. It's eaten up the dune, a bit of everything, and now the sea is entering the field. So that's three to four hectares gone. About 40 percent of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. That's not just because we love the sea. It's mostly due to the economic benefits offered by the oceans, such as shipping, fisheries, and tourism. As we continue to advance global warming by burning fossil fuels, glaciers are melting faster than ever, and that in turn increases sea levels, posing a direct threat to billions of people living in coastal areas. Global sea levels are rising twice as fast now compared to 30 years ago. The United Nations says by 2100, levels could rise by another meter.
Some major cities on the coast are trying to build defenses to protect themselves. But many experts agree that in most cases, that only serves to gain time until relocation becomes inevitable. Moving out of harm's way might pose huge challenges financially, socially, and therefore politically. But nature might not leave us any choice. Professor Stefan Costa and Sophie Madeleine from Saint Normandy University have created a virtual reality video showing what would happen if a storm hit the French coast with sea levels one meter higher than now. Take the storm of February 1990, when huge amounts of water burst into the town of Etretat. Water levels in the streets now could reach 80 centimeters to one meter and move at a rate of more than two meters a second. No one would be able to stand, and even cars would be swept away. They've shown their video to more than 200 policymakers around the country. When they see these images, of course they think it's terrible. But that's the aim of the project, to show them what could happen, and above all, to get people to reflect on what coastal life could be like tomorrow, taking into account these future hazards that unfortunately will happen. Studies like these might help policymakers prepare for the future. But for David Le Cordier, that future might come sooner than the authorities are ready for. There's no pasture land anymore that doesn't get flooded regularly. If the sea comes any closer, I don't know what I'll do. It's now only 250 meters from the farm. In just five years, the sea may have engulfed his farm completely, giving him no choice but to leave. And now we move on to another raw material that is becoming increasingly scarce. Do you know how much wood you need to make the billions of pencils produced in Germany every single year? Well, based on one appropriate tree being turned into around 10,000 pencils, that translates into 30,000 trees in Germany alone. Now this week's Doing a Bit looks at an eco-friendly option in Kenya. It's a laborious process. First, the newspapers are cut and then pasted together with glue. The rolls are dried and hardened. The paper and lead are rolled together in a specially designed machine. The company sells some of its eco pencils, but most are donated to schools. Everything is done locally. The only thing that we import is the graphite. The lead is not available locally. That's the only thing that we import from outside. But newspapers are available. And you see, we have no waste in our process. More than 100,000 pencils have already been given to children from poor families. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Whoa, what a brilliant idea. From Kenya to Central Africa to Cameroon now, as one of the world's biggest rainforests, the Ibo is a hotbed of biodiversity. That's right, Sandra, the biodiverse forest system is a refuge for a number of endangered species. Deforestation and poaching pose a threat to these unique habitats. But there's hope the Gorilla Guardian Clubs are fighting back. This rainforest can only be reached on foot. Jean Titier and the Ebel Forest Research Project team are on the lookout for rare primates. Oh. Oh, look, that's a gorilla's nest. They usually build them on the ground. After their evening meal, they make themselves a place to sleep. We have 11 primate species here, including gorillas, chimpanzees, drills, and Preuss's red colobus monkeys. The primates are in high demand with poachers who can sell them as bushmeat. 
Jean Titille also used to make his living that way. But for most of the last 10 years, he's only studied their tracks to find out which animals are traveling where in the forest. He lives in Ibuti, on the edge of Ebu Forest, one of the three villages that are taking part in the project. I have grasped what impact poaching has, and anyway, it's not really a profitable business. Okay, yes, you can earn a bit, but the income is very irregular. That's why I decided to stop hunting. Usually, now, he only gets to see the animals in video footage. The researchers have set up 17 trial cameras in the part of the forest where gorillas live. Besides chimpanzees and gorillas, these forest elephants are also threatened with extinction. And the extremely shy drills are particularly at risk. The Ebel Forest Research Project was set up by the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, which supports primate conservation. It's been collaborating with the villagers for more than 10 years. Many of them used to be poachers. Now they've learned to collect data on the animals or set up camera traps. Anyone who wants to take part must join a gorilla guardian club. Then they get paid for their work. We have to thin out the clearing a bit so the camera isn't obstructed. Once a month, the team spends a few days venturing deep into the rainforest. They use compasses and GPS to find their way. Marcel Ketchen has been part of the team for nine years. The environmental scientist records precisely where each animal trail is found. What's particularly interesting are the movements of the around 25 gorillas that were discovered here in 2002. Up to then, there were only two known gorilla subspecies in Cameroon, one group living south of the Sanaga River and another hundreds of kilometers away to the north. So the reason why we, we are collecting these samples is to do some genetic analysis to find out where, how related the gorillas of Ebo are to those found south of the Kasanaga and the Cross River gorillas. Ebo Forest in southwestern Cameroon covers an area of almost 1,500 square kilometers and borders on Nigeria. It is part of a large rainforest region, the second largest worldwide after the Amazon in Brazil. To protect the rainforest in the future, the project aims to include the residents of the more than 40 villages surrounding the forest. The three villages taking part in the project so far all have a gorilla guardians club. To enable the residents to feed their families without having to resort to poaching, they can join the local club. Here they get help to buy livestock or plant vegetables or cocoa. Like here in Iboti, there is a small school in the other two villages on the edge of the forest. The teachers receive training from the scientists, and protecting the forest and its animals has become a fixture of the curriculum. What kind of animal is that? A gorilla, ma'am. The idea is to raise awareness about the topic among the youngest villagers. What I like about the course is the gorillas. They are like people. And what I learned is that hunting isn't good because animals are like people. The project has made many of the villagers see the forest with different eyes. Like Jean Titil, some 90% of the one-time poachers have become farmers. And that's what the children see while they grow up. But the Gorilla Guardians clubs don't want things to stop there. We want a no-go zone to be created, in which the measures to guarantee the survival of the gorillas are respected, because the species is in danger of extinction. That's why he only takes his children to the edge of the forest. Look here, this trail. What animal left that trail? A porcupine. He wants his children to know about animals, but he also wants them to know when to leave the forest to its inhabitants. And once again, that's an important reminder that the best way to ensure nature conservation 
is to get kids involved at a very young age. We've come to the end of Eco Africa this week. Thanks for joining us and see you again next time. I'm Chris Lems signing off from Nigeria. So long, Chris. It is also time for me to say goodbye, but I look forward to reading all your comments on our social media platforms. So please do send them through. Until next time, do have yourselves a wonderful week and be sure to keep things green. I am Sandra Twinovdio, bidding you farewell from Kampala here in Uganda. Oh, oh, oh.